Hi, everybody. Welcome to the um, coffee hour, I think, for the Tin Can Sailors. And we're always great to get some great veterans. And with us today is uh, Richard, Richard George uh, Brennan, okay, who was a Coast Guard guy uh, who enlisted when he was 18 years of age. Right after high school. Four years after high school. After high school. Four years in the active and two years in the reserves. That right? is correct. And of course, he gives me a little thing here, which I think I'd like to read to you, is that he's currently an adopted tin can sailor. He's a, don't forget, he's Coast Guard. So he's an adopted tin can sailor, and he was invited by a couple of retiree tin can buddies to enjoy the bull sessions here in Somerset, Mass newspaper and fellowship. Uh, he received much good-natured ribbing, and uh, he feels uh, connected to anyone, past or present, who has uh, served his country. The, um, an interesting thing, he grew up in uh, Navy Town in Rhode Island, and. Uh, Almost joined the Navy, the Coast Guard recruiter, beat them to the quota, and he's still hearing about it today. <laughs> exactly. Right? from your buddy. Exactly. Most of your readers are aware of wartime missions of the Coast Guard and so on and so forth. The interesting part about all of this with, uh, with Richard is this, that people have to identify with what the, the role of each one is. For example, one of the things is the Navy is military, that is right? Cool. But the Coast Guard is military and law enforcement. That is correct. Now, in today's era, we find that any drug possessions or threat of drugs or suspicion of drug, the Coast Guard can has the ability in international waters to be able to board any ship that they uh, feel may be threatened. Now, if there's nothing there, they find nothing, they go free. If they find something, I believe, is they en enlist the Navy into it as far as um, taking over the ship, is that it? Well, yeah, if, if, if you didn't go from a Coast Guard cutter on this, yeah. but you were on a Navy ship as a Coast Guard uh, uh, company, you know, yeah. a dozen guys, yeah. you work with the Navy, you both go over to that vessel, you inspect it. If, if you're going to do anything that requires the law, then the Navy vessel, which is a good sized vessel, could be a frigate or a destroyer, becomes a Coast Guard ship only for that period of time in international waters I see. to make this legal. Uh, it's really just a mute point, but it's a legal point. Yeah. Uh, now, you, your, your career in the, in the Coast Guard includes the fact is that you were stationed outside of Cuba, Guantanamo Bay. Well, yes. Well, I was on a weather cutter. Uh, uh, a weather cutter is a ship about the size of a destroyer, World War II destroyer, destroyer escort. And it was an old Navy ship. So we had weather patrols in those days. We'd go out in between the two continents for 21 days on station, act as an aid to navigation, a weather ship, and search and rescue if within our vector. We also, we were still obviously part of the military. So periodically, even though the only time we were under the Navy Department was World War I, uh, we became part of the Navy. In World War II, we became part of the Navy. When I say part of the Navy, we just flow right in there okay. because we're practicing all the time. Okay. So we work hand in hand. So the weather cutter I was on in 1962, October 62, we were in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. We had gone from Boston to Guantanamo Bay, and we were working war games with the Navy ships, anti-submarine, etc. And that was about a four-week, three-week or four-week drill. So we'd be in and out every night. And when we were returning, and at that time, you could see the cargo ships, the Soviet cargo ships hovering off the coast because they, they couldn't enter yet. Mm -hmm. And everything was going on. It was starting to, if you read your history, it was starting to heat up between the politicians and, and uh, uh, Russia and the United States. And John Kennedy was a great president at that time. And just envision this. I'm an 18-year-old kid, because I turned 19 by then. Yeah. And we had played war games with the Navy. And in those days, you were worried about the Cold War. You were worried about nuclear attack. And very, I was very impressionable. This is the real world. Yeah. When we came back to Boston, that was when John Kennedy's famous speech came on in the Missile Crisis. And when we came into the port of Boston, 
we went on wartime conditions for maybe a week or two or whatever it was. But it was really an awakening for a very impressionable 19-year-old kid where my peer group might have been in college. Here I am, I'm dealing with the real world. You are the ship you're on, you had to arm oh, at that time. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we had to arm. We had a five inch 38 gun mount, which you see on destroyers. We had two 40 millimeter, uh, quad 40 millimeter gun mounts. Of course we had sidearms, we had anti-submarine stuff. So we were fully military ready. And, and we had to have ammunition, and imagine that, sitting in Boston, I mean, uh, uh, sitting in Boston with live ammunition and a gun mounts, yeah. <laughs> worried about worried about a war, a really. War. And then the thing I think they backed off on the missile, the missile. Right, they, they backed they, off on it. But I think at 18, you're talking about 18, 19, you had this, uh, you know, this premonition of it was a premonition, it was true, that you were in a crisis and you were, you were part of all these things. What about today? Today we're in a we're in a situation with Russia worse than you know, it's worse than before. Uh, and this is after the breakup of the Russia. Well, uh, you know, eh, it, different here. It, 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 you know, time continually changes, but the basics are the same. Yep. And I, I'm the top half of the glass guy. Okay. Yeah. I loved my four years active duty. It put me through college. I learned to interface with people at a very impressionable age. I learned to set goals and objectives. I got out a, a, a first class petty officer, which is pretty good, E6. And the GI Bill put me through college, but everything changes. Yeah. And I have all the faith in the world of this country. I mean, read history and you know we have our dips and we have Jefferson and Adams were adversaries Yep. Uh, the two-party system's important, uh, uh, but I have all the confidence in the world. I, I just don't want to talk politically no. Uh, no. as much as we are the greatest nation, and when we need to adjust, we will adjust. <clears throat> and again, I believe in the two-party system, and I believe in balance. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also opinions, it, it, if it's you all, have opinions. It's all opinion. and, and uh, but how fortunate we are. Yeah. How fortunate, me to sit down, you say, where am I at today? Yeah. Why do I feel so attached to the military? I see a young person, and I, when I was traveling in business and more than once, I would be in an airport, sitting down having a coffee, and there'd be this lone airman, a lone sailor, or a lone marine, having a coffee, and yeah, I might just go over and thank them, okay? Because you're taking, it's a sacrifice. And there was a commercial, you probably remember it, uh, Piece of the Rock was a Prudential commercial. It was an insurance company, own a piece of the rock. And I honestly feel we all in this country have a piece of the rock. But when you do your, your military time, you kind of like own it a little more. There's a little more ownership to it. Yeah, yeah. So How old are you, Richard? Yeah, yeah. I am 73. 73. Yeah, I'm a veteran, I'm a soldier. But uh, you know, I was lucky. I just I went to Germany after the war, so I was very lucky. But um, this is a passion of us to to get people like you to tell us the stories and so on that you've lived. Exactly. And it's all it's always trying to recapture that in a, in a manner called which we call Veterans Corner. Um, the, I always think of the Coast Guard, and in, in, in this sense, I must say they never had a budget. This Coast Guard who's always fighting to get a budget, and exactly. every time. There was something uh, in the waterways of the world to, you know, to be the cops of the waterways of the world. It was a Coast Guard. And as you explain that to us, uh, whereas you were both uh, law enforcement and military, and the more things that happen with the court's jurisdiction over the drug trade, the more the Coast Guard is dragged into it. I wish they put a price tag on it and help the guys out well, with doing that as well. Th there are so many other missions, search and rescue, uh, local law enforcement, in wartime uh, uh, um, security, yeah. uh, handling, ammunition handling on the ships. Um, the Antarctica expeditions used to be... Uh, oh, that were yours too, right? Those were ours, the Coast Guard icebreakers. In fact, they pretty much handle it now. In fact, I was kidding Tony. Um, when I got out of the Coast Guard in 1965, I, I was being 
process for officers candidate school as an enlisted man, but I decided I'd much rather get out and go to college and I had a young family. But at that time we had just taken over, we had four icebreakers and we just took over three more Navy icebreakers. They transferred them from the Navy to the oh, Coast Guard. Sure. So there's a lot of missions and today there's, with technology the way it is today and with how the world has changed, there's more missions and more missions and more missions. Uh, you just can't comprehend and I think it's very important that we we listen to people because you we cannot comprehend what the other person does. This is a big it's a big military, it's a big country. It sure is. And that piece of the rock is so very special. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, public service is is treasured, but you know, what good, you know, and I always tell my kids this, I get I got, I got kids that are uh, AARP now, and I kid them all the time. <laughs> you know, there's various uh, various stages in life. But yeah, I sure. always tell my kids and my grandkids, what good is my life if I can't share it? Not that I've done anything right or anything perfect, but if we can't share what we've done, and, and by virtue of me, you, you ask me to come and speak, whatever, this is me. What you see is what you get. And I'm a, a very proud American, a very proud father and I'm a very proud veteran and again I feel I feel connected with you yeah you did your well, time you know I think that, that every in my in my eyes everyone who took time to serve his country uh, in whatever capacity whatever branch of the service is a hero heroes a lot of heroes don't come back but everyone who did this and took time out of their life had no idea what they were going to get themselves into at all and had no regrets when it was over. But and and that's, that's, that's a thing that, that I believe makes heroes. And you know, you are so right, because every generation is the greatest generation. And I had to give a speech, a speech or talk, a guy was, in my hometown was a veteran of the year, and he was a World War II vet, Navy vet, then he retired from the Air Force. And I started, and we had just lost a local person in, in Iraq, and I just started, that, you know, John, you, we say you're part of the greatest generation, you bet. World War II, I said, but every generation, including our brother we just lost, and including the Continental Army and Navy, yeah. is the greatest generation. And one of the things which uh, I would like to share is when I got out of high school, I was not ready for college. I knew more than my parents, didn't have the money. I, I was as teenagerous as you could be, and I didn't want to live with my parents, couldn't get a job, and you had the draft biting you in the butt. Yep. And I'm a sailor. I, again, was either Navy or Coast Guard. And so, in a sense, I ran away from the draft and enlisted in the service that I wanted. However, and why I really, really, I uh, really respect everybody, but these kids say it's a volunteer service. And I often, I, I, I'm quite sure I would have, but who knows if I didn't have the draft nipping at me, if I would have volunteered. Right, right. right. And I think that the country, I mean, the, the adversaries of the United States uh, forget that. They forget that the big bell hasn't rung when they threaten the lion. You know what I mean? They exactly. Just, they had the big bell hasn't rung. It's it's people are not being you know not being grafted or trained. It's just a volunteer a service. And um, if God forbid, if it comes to one where they have to resort to the draft, it'll be co-ed. It'll be a lot of things that you know you dreamed of would happen. But you know, and, and in history, you said ring the bell, but the sleeping giant. This country has so many resources and it starts with its manpower. Oh, sure. mm -hmm. And quote Admiral Yamamoto, who was educated in the United States uh, prior to World War II. He was the Admiral of Pearl Harbor? The, yes, he was the commander of the Pearl Harbor expedition or whatever, the Pearl Harbor attack. And one of his quotes was, and he was not pro this. He was a dedicated man. It was a different rule in, in Japan. But he just shook his head and he said, we've awakened a sleeping giant. And how true. Oh. If, if, you know, I encourage anybody young that's looking at this, read, please read history because you'll understand today. I mean, okay. it's that simple. Well, we, um, we, we really 
like to talk to people like yourself, Richard, and because it gets it's heartwarming for us um, to be able to you know capture those moments or try to capture those moments mm -hmm. in your life, um, and then reflect it through the camera. But um, it's all about you. It's all about every one of you. So it's not about us. It's all about you. We've been privy to different tapes and films that have been given to us. We have. We've had some really, uh, like yourself, there's no categories of the people who come before us. We love them all. And to my way of thinking, no matter what a branch, whether you flew above us or you swam beneath us, you are our heroes. You, you know, I, I just share a, a kind of a funny aside, I, I think, and because I'm in a wonderful window of life. I'm fat, healthy, retired, comfortable. And I surround myself with beautiful people, uh, yeah. people of my values. And one of my buddies is out there, he's a retired Navy commander. And as four of us stick, get together, and Hugh was a destroyer man. We got a buddy who's a retired submarine officer. And we got another buddy, we all met through church, okay? Yeah. And we all do things together, who did two years in the Army years ago. Yeah. So. But we go see movies together and we go for lunch and we'll, we'll meet for lunch maybe once a month, see a movie that appeals to all of us. And we cut each other up big time. We have so much fun, <laughs> but we love each other. Everybody and gets a knife and I fork. get beat up. And, and the last, there's a movie, uh, The Finest Hour, true movie about uh, the greatest Coast Guard rescue off Cape Cod of a split tanker. And when we sat down, when this came out, I said to everybody at lunch, I said, this is mandatory viewing, okay? As yeah. simple as that. There's no, and so I, getting together this time, it was kind of tough. So I went with Paul. Uh, Paul is the Army guy. And I went with him two weeks ago, because Hugh wasn't around, and, and Archie couldn't make it. And in that movie, I said, Paul, there's something for you, and there was a Jeep, okay? And last week, I went with Hugh, and he was an engineer, and that movie has a lot to do with engineering vessels, uh, engineering spaces on a ship. And Archie was a submariner, and he's a character. And the special effects, the self-riding lifeboat, you could see it under the water, okay? 36-foot yeah. self-riding. And I'm sitting next to Arch, and uh, first thing he says, not many people in the movie said either, where's the periscope? So see, there's something for all of us. Yeah. As veterans and as citizens, and you know, if we can take all what we've done in life, share it, enjoy it, and appreciate the window we're in. I, I'm sorry, I get philosophical. Oh, no, that's okay. And, that's okay. That's what uh, it's all about. We uh, we would like to thank you very much for spending your time with us and uh, you know bringing us to the the Coast Guard. And it's refreshing too because we're being inundated by the Navy. I have nothing wrong with that. But I can't admit that I was a soldier. <laughs> Richard, we thank you so much for thank being you. on. We thank you. We'll give you a copy of this tape, and we kind of move all this along for everybody. Thank, thank you very you. much. You are our hero. They well, everybody is. I know. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>